Everybody and welcome to a champion clashing, king of the ring flinging and chasing Molly promoting episode of the Brothers of Discussion. We're going to cover everything from Chad Gable and Baron Corbin's forthcoming clash for the King of the Ring title. Break down all the title matches coming up this Sunday and finally feature the first ever interview on the Brothers of Discussion. We spoke with Shelly Pack, the writer and star of the movie Chasing Molly, as well as the director, Josh Sutherland. Matt, very exciting episode. Another hot, tasty week of wrestling. How the heck are you? I'm doing really good. Uh, this is very, like like you said, it's a very exciting episode, uh, especially since we're getting that first interview out of the way, um, but also a fantastic conversation uh, with, with two creatives I'm very proud to be associated with um, in... Um, Oh, Shelly and Josh. So I, I hope that you're all gonna stick around to the end of the show. Uh, is when we're uh, now that we're we're running closer to our hundredth episode, and we we're gonna be scheduling some more interviews. Uh, where we're gonna be posting most of those interviews. But uh, if you want to see every episode before this, don't forget to go to bodpodcast.com, brothersofdiscussion.com. Head over to at bodpodcast to follow us on uh, Twitter. Uh, you can find us on Instagram as the Brothers of Discussion, or actually. Sorry, Brothers of Discussion, not The Brothers of Discussion. Uh, find us on Facebook the same way. And uh, what else do we got? We've got our Facebook group that's doing pretty good. Um, I guess... Uh, yeah, added about 15 members this week. Well, I like not it. our group. Uh, on, the, the face, the, on the regular Facebook page, we added a bunch of people. Uh, still like to see all of you join the Facebook group because uh, that's how we're actually getting the best interactions where we're... Getting posts from you guys, which we enjoy quite a bit, and uh, you know we like we like interacting as Matt and Mike every now and then instead of just as the brothers of discussion. Uh, so, Mike, why don't we jump in? Yeah, we like to break kayfabe a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> why don't we jump in? Uh, you want to go King of the Ring first? Absolutely. Um, I mean, we were really pumped when they announced that they're going to do this title. Uh, we we both had. You know our picks for who's going to make it to the finals. I, I don't know if a lot of people agreed with us, but I definitely feel like a couple of uh, Phil the Groundhog prognosticators. Because lo and behold, Mr. Baron Corbin has found himself in the finals, Matt. Well, I mean, um, I'd, I'd have to jump in and apologize because my guy bowed out of the competition before uh, his match even started on Tuesday. Uh, but yeah, let's we'll continue the conversation. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he was, he was right there. Uh, he was robbed. Uh, I think we're still waiting for confirmation. Uh, on TV, they said he broke his ankle. My God. Uh, shattered his ankle. It's it's shitty now. His ankle's done. So he needed a replacement. He wasn't even in the finals, the semifinals match to uh, complete the King of the Ring uh, bracket here. So Chad Gable this week had to go up against... A mystery man that turned out to be the best in the world, Shane McMahon. Matt, we'll kick it off here. I, I think a lot of people were first a little a little grumbly. They had little grumblies in their tumblies, yep. and uh, they were they were not happy to see Shane out there. But I I think you and I are going to be on the same page. I think uh, I think Shane basically was a pawn here to try and generate as much negative crowd reaction as possible to make Chad look even facier than he could have. Um, you know, against, like, a, a normal bad guy. So, let me immediately argue against that. <laughs> All right. Um, if you're doing that, then you got to keep Kevin Owens off that off that match. Because if the goal is to make Gable your hero, all that happened was the story turned to being about Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon. And once the episode was over, I mean, you got a couple tweets about Gable, but everybody wanted to talk about Kevin Owens and what was going to happen next. So a huge misstep uh, in that regard. Like if the goal was Gable is our new hero, I would say fail. Um, from from especially from the the point of view that it's super easy to do, um, and they were so close and they fucked it up. 
See, I, I, I disagree just because it wasn't like, like Shane picked Kevin and basically said, if, you know, if you don't kind of, you know, tip the scales in my favor, then, you know, you could be out of a job. So I think it, it, you know, Kevin was out there doing the fast counts on Shane's behalf. Um, I think it, it just made you kind of grind your molars even more because then you had to see not only Shane um, cheating, but he was also, you know, getting one over on the beloved Kevin Owens. So it, to me, it reminded me of, um, you know, when Randy Orton won the Royal Rumble, what was that, two years ago, and they brought Roman Reigns in at number 30 to, to really piss people off. Yeah. Um, that, that's kind of what it felt like here is they were trying to use um, a heat machine and Shane McMahon, because nobody wants to see the best in the world who who brought out that fucking championship again, um, you know, come out on top for King of the Ring. No, yeah, and I, I, I know where you're coming from in generating the heat. I just mean, if that was the ultimate goal, then you had to keep Kevin Owens out of that. Like, you were going to generate... If Shane came out there and got some licks in, which I think, what I think is most hilarious here is we just found out Gable could kick the shit out of The Undertaker because of how hard of a time Undertaker had putting down Shane McMahon and how quickly Chad Gable really had (laughs) Shane taken (laughs) care of. I mean, think about, you know what? Take Undertaker off that list. How many, I mean, The Miz he could destroy because Shane beat The Miz a couple times in a row. So... I mean, another, I mean, that that's a totally different conversation for a different day. One of the reasons why WWE does not focus on wins and losses uh, so that you can pretty much do whatever you want in the storytelling. Uh, but just, I'm, I, I'm, I'm bringing that up because I see I think... the Kevin Owens edition as like a very shallow thought as well as making Gable go over so easily on Shane. Like if they had Shane come out and like I said, get those licks in, but then also almost get the victory. Like yeah. we would be, I, I mean, I'd be going ape shit. Like I, if you saw that one, two, and then Gable well, we, just barely kicked out, that would be insane. Yeah. Well, we used to do um, like every year at WrestleMania, the undertaker was the measuring stick. And somehow Shane McMahon has become the wrestling <laughs> measuring stick. How quickly can you defeat Shane McMahon? And if you can't defeat him, were you even a wrestler to begin with? <laughs> well, let me let me book this, Mike, to be one of the greatest endings to SmackDown ever. And you could still do, like, have this awesome match and have Gable get over and still have Kevin Owens get fired. But repeat the Mankind WWE Championship victory or WWF Championship victory and have Kevin Owens, who's already doing the stunner, come out with a chair, smash Shane, go to the locker room, Gable wins. End of the, you know, end of the night. And then you fire Kevin Owens next week. Easy as pie. There. Mike, I thought of this just now. And I don't get paid for the WWE. I, I wish I did. Uh, I would love to be a writer. And uh, you know what? I just booked uh, I just booked a hell of an ending to SmackDown. And I didn't have weeks to think of it. Hmm. I, uh, hmm. I mean... I don't, I don't hate it. I just, you know, King of the Ring is supposed to be, you know, a little bit of where you can show off your wrestling ability. So I think this was a better, this version is a better way for Chad Gable to showcase what? his skills. No, you're insane. Rather, I just said I wanted it to mean? be he a real match. What do you mean? He won with a submission move. Huh? He won with a submission move. Woo! I mean, he's not winning with a, a steel chair and a stunner from Kevin Owens. Yeah, but this it, is a real submission move. The way this rolled out, it was basically a squash. This was not, like, like it would have been, to show your wrestling talent is it not. It wasn't really a squash, though. Shane got a lot of hits in. I mean, after cheating, of right. course, but he, yeah, the you match... know, it wasn't like a completely one-sided affair. That's a squash. I mean, he, basically, Chad won the match in, like a, like, a minute, and then it was two out of three falls but let me let me say this the wrestling to to say that you're a great wrestler is not being involved in that match i think it i think it was more about if if you went my route you're showing that you can take the licks you can tell a better story where you're going through the struggle i just i there's I, no way that anybody will, in the in, on planet is, Earth agrees with you that this was a better showcase of pro wrestling. You heard it here first. 
Matt is mailing pink slips to the bookers of SmackDown Live. Any hoozles. Gable got the win. Guys are out of a job. Matt is bringing back the Stone Cold chair moment. I like it. Uh, it would have been, Matt, Mike, I, it would have made so much sense. Stone Cold was on the night before. They're passing the torch to Kevin Owens. I, I just, do we want to jump into Kevin Owens getting fired? I thought we were passing the torch from The Undertaker to Sami Zayn. That's what I That's what I heard Tuesday night. Well, we just talked about um, Kevin Owens in that match, so let's talk about him getting fired instead of coming back. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, as far as how, how that goes, uh, I, you know, that means that poor Kevin is stuck in another Shane feud. Um, but I don't think that it means that it's, you know, all hope is lost for Kevin. Um, or is it? It feels like a lot of their... They're, a lot of their main guys are kind of toiling away in the mid card, uh, you know, like AJ, Daniel Bryan. And toiling is the wrong word. It seems like they're they're having fun in the mid card. And add Kevin to that list, another guy who's staying away from the main event picture. To maybe oh, he's going to extend this feud with Shane Matt. And in our show notes today, with it right around the corner, we're only you know we got to do this Sunday one more pay per view, and then we're right there for Survivor Series. And Matt. Is this starting to get that? Are you starting to get that smell that maybe it's going to be Kevin Owens' team versus Shane's? All right, mm-hmm. Mike. Man. The only way that's the case is if Kevin Owens is bringing all of his NXT buddies with him, because KO tweeted fourteen twenty four twenty, which if you run the dial on the alphabet, that spells NXT. And ten hours later, which. Looks like they're either at Universal Studios or maybe Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Kevin Owens tweeted a picture of his daughter and her friend. And her friend, Mike, who Kevin did not use his face, but you can tell it's him, is Tommaso Ciampa. So, ooh, (laughs) the, I mean, if it's not NXT, this is one mean series of tweets from kevin owens uh to tease nxt and then to show a picture of his daughter with tommaso champa at disney world or universal studios or something but i i hope it doesn't come back to shane mcmahon because uh i think we've proved that the show goes okay when shane just disappears uh i should i shouldn't even say okay i i you kind of like Elias gets knocked out of that King of the Ring match, and people were immediately saying like the uh, you know Shane's coming back. But in my head, I I wasn't thinking right. that it had completely escaped my mind. I forgot that he was a thing, and that's what I want. So hopefully this doesn't mean Shane is coming back into the spotlight. But I mean, if it is about Survivor Series, then hopefully this means like. The Survivor Series will be SmackDown versus NXT, and we'll get Gargano, Champa, Kevin Owens. I don't know, maybe Fandango and um, Tyler Breeze. Well, yeah, that. Yeah, it doesn't mean that they have to be up, you know, called up permanently, but it, it maybe it would be an opportunity because you know we know Kevin Owens and Adam Cole are buddies, you know, to have Undisputed Era uh, shoot up and. Yeah. Uh, you know, fights machines, cronies. Well, we also know um, NXT TakeOver is going away, which we probably should have put in the show notes here. So that could mean that, you know, by by the Royal Rumble, NXT TakeOvers are being replaced with this, the Worlds Collide, which um, was fine when we watched it the first time. It just wasn't that amazing. Uh, so hopefully that'll get some more production value thrown at it. Uh, but, Mike... And this is where I say this should have been in our show notes. Is NXT the brand getting the call up to the main roster? And pay per views will now feature Raw titles. Where did you see that? I didn't see that news at all. Uh, it's their new packages for uh, for the Royal Rumble that are being uh, sold starting tomorrow morning. If you get a Royal Rumble package, there's no NXT takeover, but there is a Worlds Collide uh, special uh-huh. event. Uh-huh. Yep. Just popped in my head. Definitely a huge storyline here that we completely... (laughs) 
Um, yeah, I would keep... yeah, this was huge news a, a couple days ago. Um, when you sent me the text message that said NXT news or Royal Rumble news or something, I thought that's what you meant. So I Google searched Royal Rumble, and the first 20 stories that popped up were no more NXT takeovers. Hmm. Yeah. So... Yeah, it looks like a... I mean, it, I, but, well, this, this, these are definitely going to be some hot takes. Uh, this sounds like a really good idea just because... Um, it, it, it looks like we're taking the shackles off, and it's not just NXT. Um, I mean, this sounds like a spot where you could have a Kevin Owens pop in. You could have, you know, dudes from the UK pop in. Um, I mean, it was it was really fun what we saw last year. Um, geez, oh, Pete. Uh, you know, the Tyler Bates, the Velveteen Dreams going at it. Um, you know, they started out with that Battle Royal, and then they had all those, uh, you know, unique one-on-one -on -one matches that you wouldn't ordinarily get to see just because of, um, you know, the strictness of the rosters. Yeah. Um, or at least the, maybe not strictness is the right word, but like, you know, keeping the continuity. Um, but if this is going to be, you know, an opportunity for like the Cesaros of the world to come in and, you know, challenge people, um, you know, the Finn Balors of the world to have those, you know, Jordan Devlin matches. Um, but it, it just sounds like a, a great idea. Um, I think it's, I think Matt, the only, the only, potentially like questionable part is if you look at uh i don't know maybe the past three three four years or so as a wrestling fan maybe the best thing about the wwe network was was how consistent consistently great takeovers have been so you know i understand opening up the roster but you know knowing that I had an NXT takeover coming up, I knew I was going to get, you know, about two to three hours of just A-plus wrestling. Yeah. Well, does that cheapen the, the network for you, then? Does it cheapen the network? Yeah, if we lose our, uh, our takeovers. No, I mean, if we're going to, you know, have more of these, if they're just going to call them Worlds Collide, you know, um, events, that's okay. I don't think they're going to do Worlds Collide. Um, collide over and over and over or if, if they're gonna have yeah i mean well i mean if they're gonna have something you know like that with all these these clashes from different rosters i, I think we're gonna be in good hands all right i'll let you have it i think it does i think it cheapens it i think they're if they get rid of the takeovers yeah. and we lose a special event to watch because we got worlds collide last year anyway um so if we're gonna if we're gonna lose the takeovers it's it's a sad it's a sad day for wrestling fans um sure we'll get you know we'll get things added to the uh to the main roster pay-per-views and that'll help us stretch out some storylines and not have to stuff mat useless matches into uh those pay-per-view events uh but we could also end up having 20 match special events <laughs> and we're gonna be so exhausted yeah. we're not even gonna enjoy the main event by the time it comes up so there's a lot going through my head. There's a lot to talk about, a lot to dissect, and I only just now threw this at you. So, and we don't even know what's actually happening. Maybe they want to make yeah, sure. Yeah, we don't have any details. Maybe they want to make sure that you buy the takeover separately, and they don't want you to get any sort of discount with a package. Who knows? But um, yeah, no official statement. But at least we know what their travel package is. There's no NXT takeover option. There's only um, Worlds Collide and the rumble by the way if anybody knows mm -hmm. when these tickets are going on sale i can't believe it's september and we still don't know uh just the solo ticket uh yeah let me know because we're gonna buy them the second they're available uh the brothers of discussion will be there so be be great to know if somebody has uh, a code maybe you you're from texas and you've been to a show and they announced a special code just for you throw it my way why not um i'd love i'd love <laughs> to go so there's that right um yeah i you know we, we can't dwell too much longer on this because we got to wait and see what the details are but uh kind of interesting if they if they do go away from takeovers because they've been so successful um i guess before we kind of get into our um uh, you know some other stuff we're really excited about the new new content here um we have some old content, Matt. Uh, Stone Cold and Undertaker came back. Um, 
it looks like just, you know, they were in Madison Square Garden. Uh, WWE has not had, like, TV tapings there in years. Um, you know, they would do house shows there, but but not, um, you know, have the TV tapings yeah. um, for us in that in that beautiful stadium, historic stadium. Historic. Um, That's... It's it's pretty cool. I I, I kind of like it. Um, I don't know why we're I don't know why you're throwing jabs at it, but uh, um, I guess my only thing was you know I it's it's always fun to see Stone Cold, uh, especially when AJ sold the uh, Stone Cold Stunner like The Rock. Um, I think this could have been. Tell you know, let me know if you think I'm wrong. I think this could have been a great spot for the Fiend. Uh, to come out and either attack Stone Cold or The Undertaker. I think that's what uh, The Fiend's promo was about. Like, I, I know how he's kind of been given this. I mean, it, it, there has to be something, right? There has to be something where they said, you can do whatever you want. This is, be, this is successful uh, because he's been feeding Vince money uh, on, on his promos. And he also complained now about not being able to go out and attack Stone Cold. I, I feel like that's what it, that's what it was like. Bray Bray was trying to say like that the nice side of him was like okay we won't go attack Stone Cold and all of his puppets were like go get him so I <laughs> I think at least that's my argument as far as I can go with with remembering what was actually said in that promo but I think Bray yeah. Wyatt actually did want to go get Stone Cold and uh, somebody stopped it uh, I don't know if it was uh, Steve it was himself the Vince puppet. Right. Right. Um, oh, I mean, oh, you mean in real life? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> meant, which rambling rabbit, you bastard? Uh, I, I just, I, I mean, you know, Bray is already mega over, but you know, if they they're gonna keep promising us, oh, we're gonna, you know, this reboot, this reboot is for real. Um, I think this would have been a spot where. You know, my God, the crowd wouldn't know what to do if the fiend came out and tackled Stone Cold or like no sold a stunner or something like that. Um, instead, you know, they just got the pop with uh, you know the rattlesnake and the dead man, so you know it's fine, it's fun. Uh, it, I just it could have been more. I, I I had, you know, eyes. I my eyes were you know bigger than my stomach. I guess I didn't I didn't get I didn't get the tasty delicious payoff for the fiend that i want and i you know they they can't really give uh too much to with with undertaker and stone cold and the fiend we have to accept is still new and the slower this moves the better like yeah i'm still not a fan of him fighting for the universe championship but it looks like there's things online that say that's what's booked for anybody looking for a ticket it says the fiend braun Strowman, and seth rollins going at it next month woohoo wow um not a fan of that so we don't know for sure again that happens like every month and and usually it changes um they just want you to buy tickets but i well you know what i'll say uh, what what do you think what's the main reason that you're against that sorry i took a drink um i got ice cubes in my mouth the main reason i'm against that is because the fiend does not need a championship he is not he's like alistair black he's not the guy to hold a belt i think the belt would be like circumstantial and he's made claims to chasing after it like talking about being in a universal title match um of course it's bray's character so he knows his character better but i think it works better that this guy just wants to hurt people and isn't looking for a championship oh excuse me a championship and and, and right when he becomes the champion he becomes a target and we know He's losing that belt eventually. So, and I, you know, I'd rather we built him up for a whole year and we're just in awe of this huge winning streak. And if he wins the title or if he's there and he doesn't win the title, then what? Then what do we do? Which, you know, it might just be one of those things where they're saying, well, we have to put him in a title match uh, because everybody loves him so much, which is stupid. But... <laughs> You know, we talk about all the time. I'm just going to keep rambling here. But we talk, I'm doing my rambling rabbit. Uh, we talk about utilizing your assets. And that's been like, I think once an episode, I say that phrase. You're not 
properly utilizing your asset if you have a universal championship and then you have a huge like marquee superstar main eventer that doesn't need a championship involved to be interesting and you go combine them together you know so so we we saw SummerSlam. now it's clash of champions uh next is is what hell in a cell he's not scheduled to yeah. be a clash of champions so you're saying his second match is going to be a title match i there's so much there like there there's so much value to get out of that character and out of how much people care about it and how excited they get just to see him walk out and he did actually come out at, at msg i don't know if you saw that online well, but if you're... you i mean if it's you go that route and just gonna have him do matches for a whole year i guess when he becomes champion that's where you have problems because then you're like well he already defeated these people i think maybe what they're thinking about doing is you know second match is super early you're right but if you make him champion early then it, it does become this this kind of cool mountain you can you can build uh, with the belt instead of like once he becomes champion, there, there isn't anybody left for him to, you know, fight and feud against because he's he already defeated them to get to that point. Because but that's you're not you're not gonna have like you know short one off matches with them. You're gonna be building up on the on the playhouse. You're gonna be doing weird, you know, stalking uh, promos from him. It's it's gonna be elongated. Um, but that's I... and I think that if you want if you want the fiend to be champion, which I I think is deserving which means he he could open and close shows um uh, you know wwe learned their lesson the hard way I, I think it was was it two years ago um you know and they had all these ambitious plans for the the shield getting together breaking up feuding with each other and then um you know rollins got that awful injury so now it's kind of like once they feel they have something hot they try to pull the trigger so now the fiend is just electricity. Like he's the best thing of the night. As soon as people see that goofy, you know, playhouse theme, they they're out of their seats. You can hear it on the TV. Like people are excited just to see a a, a promo of like you know a, a guy who's not even in the ring, cut a promo. Yeah. No, you're uh, right. But that that's. So I just I think I think they're trying to capture that lightning in a bottle. And not get it to a point when he is champion, no. there isn't anybody for him to feud. And with. I totally understand that. Like that's that's that whole idea. Like I said, like oh they like him. Well, let's give him a championship match. My problem is we're playing the short term game, which is what always hurts the WWE if we do do that. Like you're you're uh, to to talk about how much everybody loves his promos. What are we gonna do after he does his Universal Championship promo? What what else is gonna be in the show for Raw? Or if he chases after the WWE Championship, what what else is on SmackDown? Like, there's there's got to be these other storylines that are important to us. Otherwise, we just keep running into these pay per views that have matches that are probably going to be fun to watch, but they don't have stories. Um, I just I, I think that's the main problem is looking at this from a short term perspective, and there's obviously a way to argue to do it to get it going. But I think that's more like how the WWE looks at things, and we're not always 100% happy with what they what they do. And, uh, you know, overexposure, too, with, with Bray, having him open and close the show, I think is the exact opposite of what makes this character so mysterious and makes us cling to his every word and, and makes it so special is because they, they, so far, have taken their time with him. And we haven't seen promos that were written that day or a second promo that they were like, okay, you messed up earlier today. So when you go out later, make sure you say these things. It's, it's so like plotted out and, and planned and the production in it is, you know, obviously it's childish, but it's, it's done so well. And there's the right cuts, the right words are said, the right timing, it, it all, it's all just been perfect so far. And I think, uh, you know, you put him in the universal title picture and that all all of that perfectness, quote unquote, uh, in my opinion, goes out the window. I, I don't know. I, I, I respectfully disagree. I, I just, I don't think we can keep just doing, pro, you know, feuds where he just kind of picks on somebody for a while. I think ultimately you get, you get him a goal and that goal is going to be the goal. Um, and then this 
But then you're the thing you're with making the fiends. The, the thing with the fiends too. Right now. What do you mean? I, I'm saying that if we put him immediately into the tight, like, so you're saying one Finn Balor pro or one Finn Balor feud, he destroys Finn, and there's no other need for a, you know, like a chasing a prime superstar. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't use the word boring. I don't, I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't think that that's going to be the, the best way to, to do it. I think you got to start to, you know, raise the stakes because this part of the, the magic of this character is that it's, I mean, the fiend is new, but Bray is old and he's one of the few wrestlers ever to, um, like visually make reference, uh, you know, to his past, you know, uh, with these, uh, you know, with the puppets, um, you know, like the Husky one and, you know, Ramblin' Rabbit and, uh, 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 the, you know, you know who I'm talking about, the Sister Abby, all the puppets, you know, they're, they're, they're referencing that. So this is, this is, if he was to become champion, it's a way for him to also like reference his, his past and, and, like Bray Wyatt from the beginning, you know, back in what, 2000, was it 14, 13? So it wouldn't just be the Fiend becoming champion. It would be Bray Wyatt finally getting his his turn to kind of, you know, run the field for a year. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Matt, uh, just want to say pretty cool that Tegan Knox came back. She broke her left tibia, dislocated her kneecap, tore her ACL, MCL, and LCL, and tore her meniscus, and had bone contusions. Um, cool to see her back on TV, um, but yeah, we do want to hop into oh, the wait, interview. Oh wait, no, we want to get. We were gonna do the Clash of Champions card first, and then do the interview. Okay. Um, yeah, Clash of Champions. I think we always call it Night of Champions. I'm, I'm pretty proud of us for writing the right thing down. Um, kind of. I guess we can kind of sprint through the card here. Um, I mean, he got uh, probably gonna open the show cruiserweight championship. Gulak. Drew style uh, versus Humberto Carrillo versus Lince Dorado. Who? Uh... Lince. Oh, Lince. <laughs> My bad. Yeah, he got to fight uh, Ray Mysterio and jab out to him this week. Uh, still pretty fun, Matt. I don't know. This this just sounds like it's going to be a, a super athletic contest. Uh, I I would be pretty surprised if Gulak lost. I don't know enough about the story to know where it's going, but just by the look of things, uh, looking at Humberto and Lince, I mean, I don't see those guys as as championship material. So I'm gonna go with Drew, and he keeps holding on to it. Yeah, it was. I don't know. It was a goofy feud because like one of them qualified, and then the other one's like, "Well, didn't I kind of qualify?" And then they're kind of like, "Well, now you're both in it." So I don't know. Oh, fun. Uh, but. If anybody knows how to handle like three way or four way matches, it's the you know two hundred five live division. Well, um, if that's the story. Yeah, then got... It's definitely Drew Gulak because they're going to be focused. They they were already focused on each other rather than Drew. So if that was the storyline, yeah. Drew's winning. We got uh, Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross, the women's tag team champions, going against um, Fire and Desire, <laughs> Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville. Um, Matt, I, I think, uh, you know, Alexa's been her usual wonderful self. Um, I don't know if you saw it. Mandy Rose was, like, taunting Nikki Cross and, like, you want to look like me. And Alexa's like, nobody wants to look like you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, I think I think the, the belts would uh, – because I, I want to see Sonya Deville have, have some sort of championship. I'm a big fan of hers, and I think Mandy could cut some pretty good heel promos. I, I would like to see Fire and Desire win, but I don't know. I mean, Alexa is the best best mic worker in the division. So, Well, there's definitely maybe, – Maybe you keep it on There's her. definitely not enough, you know, we've seen from Mandy and Sonya to say that they're ready to hold on to, uh, hold on to the title and – care you know be be those champions and have more fun with it than uh, alexa nikki what is all that popping going on over there oh that was a what's called a fumble i uh, dropped my cellular device well i hope we don't use the skype inter- or the skype conversation now 
<laughs> Jesus, that was so loud. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the same reasons you're saying, you know, Alexa being the best uh, promo artist in the women's division, I, I think it just makes sense to have Alexa and Nikki carry these titles for a while. They're both great at wrestling. Uh, they caught a fun promo, not just, you know, a good one, but a fun one. And uh, it's... I think you're getting everything you could get out of like Sasha and Bailey holding the titles and then mix it with what the Iconics had. And that's why Alexa and Nikki are great for this as, as these titles keep growing. Um, so next up would be Roman Reigns and Eric Rowan. Mike, there is no chance for poor Eric Rowan uh, to go over in this match. This is, oh, gosh, this is, I know it. Go ahead. I know we like talking about missed opportunities. Um, I really liked Rowan's promo this week when he was just like, Roman, 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 Roman. I think Roman should have returned Volley and said, Rowan, Rowan, Rowan. (laughs) And then kind of like split screen it and say each other's names. It was kind of sweet. Yeah, I think you're right. Roman's, uh, he's going to be Superman punching himself to victory. All right. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, he's said enough there. Yeah, I mean, like Smack I said, Roman team championship match. Yeah. I, I mean, Roman oh. was going to win, but you did want to add something. No, right, I didn't. I you were supposed to jump into the SmackDown tag team. I already said Roman was going to win. You gotta, we gotta keep bouncing. You know, you you finish one and then you start the next one and then I, you know. Yeah. Sometimes as uh, brothers of discussion, you want to discuss the match. I thought you'd have one thing to say. Anyway. Uh, SmackDown Tag Team Championship match. We got the New Day versus the Revival. Uh, man, uh, the Revival's been used and abused. I, I, you know, they're they're not winning. This is the New Days. Yeah, and the and the Revival's role as being like lackeys for Randy Orton, um, just it doesn't it doesn't bode well for them going over like their their role has never been about getting these championship titles so for them to win would it just like it'd be a surprise but it also really doesn't make sense uh because they like i said they've been about helping randy not fighting xavier and Big E. so yeah the the new day are gonna still be tag champions after uh clash of champions so uh moving forward we got intercontinental championship match the uh brand new Shinsuke and Sami Zayn combo going against uh, the Miz, and of course uh, Shinsuke defending. Um, what's funny is this: this is to me the hardest one to pick because I could totally see the WWE handing this to the Miz because the Miz is, is on kind of. Uh, if you look at his win loss record this year, it's it doesn't look great. So you got to think he's in need of a victory, but Shinsuke and Sami Zayn just getting started as champion and promo artist of, of uh, an, or manager in that regards for Sami Zayn. Um, I think that combination is gold. So unless they have another plan for Sami Zayn right after this, I I just at this point have to say it's got to be Nakamura going over the Miz. Yeah, this match I feel super confident in. Like, uh, I'm not a gambling man, but I would put a lot of money on Nakamura. Uh, he's going to get, he's going to have Sami Zayn in his corner. Uh, the Miz is, you know, still kind of booked as as an underdog. I, I don't think wins and losses really matter to him, and I don't think he's going to add to his Intercontinental Championship total at this pay per view. I think it'll happen in his, you know, maybe in the next twelve months or so, but it's it's not going to be on Sunday. Um, moving on, we got we got one with uh, kind of a kind of a proving ground match because we had a we had the big uh, five on five where Cedric Alexander actually pinned AJ Styles to win the five on five. Pretty cool moment for him. Um, he's going to, you know, challenge AJ for the U S title. Um, obviously AJ is probably, you know, going to have, uh, the OC in his, in his corner. I think this, this would, this would floor the audience. If Cedric Alexander came out of nowhere to, to beat AJ, um, this just looks like a spot for Styles to kind of, you know, let Cedric get some offense in, and then, you know, AJ, you know, ends up winning because he's AJ Styles. I mean, yeah, I'd have to go back to what I was saying about the revival um, and their role with Randy Orton. Now we have a very <laughs> clear role of what uh, Gallows and Anderson are up to. They are backing up AJ Styles. They are not tag team champions. They are not even a legit legit tag team that can perform well together. 
Um, you know, they're they're goofy. They're Bulk and Skull. Uh, but Bulk and Skull were pretty good at, at getting over all, every now and then with a prank um, on, on the Power Rangers. So I'm going to say the OC is going to come into play. And while Cedric Alexander is probably going to do enough for the victory, AJ Styles is holding on to that U.S. championship, especially with... Um, you know, all of these movements of shows and hopefully more eyes going to the WWE programming, I think they absolutely a thousand percent want AJ Styles holding on to a title. Uh, so right. that would mean, moving forward, uh, we've got the SmackDown Women's Championship match, Bailey against Charlotte. Mike, I know you said that Nakamura and Miz was an easy pick, even though I thought it was difficult. I think this is also a very difficult pick. Um, I, I just, there's no reason that Charlotte can't take the title here unless we want to make the argument about, like, the length of time Bailey's had it and is, is it time for her to have a, a, you know, a lengthy title run? Um, or is it just about we're going, we're going to Fox soon, so we're going to put the belt on Ric Flair's daughter? And I hate to put it that way, but, I mean, if you watched well... ESPN this past week, they all... Had a big old boner for the Undertaker calling Ric Flair the man. So when you look at yeah. the broad perspective of pro wrestling, we're still looking at Charlotte as Ric Flair's daughter. We don't do that, but anybody that's not a super fan and the people they're trying to bring over to Fox to watch wrestling are going to want to see Ric Flair's daughter holding that title instead of Bailey. Well, I think... Uh... I would kind of talk about the two women's championship matches together because it's kind of cool that we're going to have so one on one and one on one for <laughs> I'm just for the four horse women. <laughs> um, Cause you're going to have Becky versus Sasha for the raw championship. And then SmackDown, like you said, it's going to be Bailey and Charlotte. Um, I think the, the, the most exciting thing for me to see out of these two matches would be, uh, you know, for Bailey to, to, maybe not necessarily go full heel, but, you know, for her to maybe accept some Sasha assistance to either win or for her to kind of interfere in Sasha's match to, you know, help Banks get over Becky. Because, um, like, Sa uh, uh, Bailey had a match this week and she was, you know, doing the same old, you know, flailing arms, inflatable tube man thing and hugging kids. And it just kind of, you know, reminded me of how they kind of treat the women's division with, you know, everybody kind of gets treated like Big Show with, you know, it, it doesn't seem like there's, I don't know. Like, it seems like a week to week, you know, are you good or bad? You know, I, 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 I wish I had the guts to, you know, pull the trigger and make Bailey a heel. I think that would be the most exciting thing to happen this Sunday um, with this women's division. Um, so I, I, I hope that happens just for storytelling's sake. Because uh, then it would be cool to see Bailey win like a like a heel victory clean over Charlotte. Right. So it, are are you taking? What's your recap then? Because are, are oh I, I here my the best case scenario is is Bailey and Sasha leave with the belts. Okay, so then I I'd have to agree with the Sasha part of this. So moving on to the Raw Women's Championship match. Um, I do think Sasha's winning, and I think these these four ladies, as we know, are pals. So if there's any issue of like letting one go over the other, I think they all love building each other up. So Becky's gonna use all of her power to help Sasha get back at the top of you know like uh, top of the main event. Not that really you know not that Sasha really needed it with all of her her followers and people that are would would you know take a bullet for her. But um, I I just at this point, Becky's done the Becky thing. Like, and I'm not saying I, I want, you know, the man to end. I'm just saying she's done enough that it doesn't matter if she loses the title. She can win it right back. We, we saw her uh, get over after losing to Asuka. I think there's been so much great done for the Becky Lynch character that we don't, we don't need her to hold on to the titles. We just want her involved in the main event. And Sasha winning doesn't take her out of that. But... It does help Sasha build herself back up because if Sasha loses this after being away for all these months, then what? And the only way you get away with that loss and still have Sasha be relevant without it being very difficult or very easy for us to believe is there's got to be, you know, some, uh, 
you know, interference, interference from yeah, some, something like yeah. that going on. But uh, I think the easy route to go is just give Sasha the title and keep this rolling on for a few months. So uh, that brings yeah. us, or did, were you, did you have a rebuttal on that? No, oh. I, I just think that of uh, every single match uh, on this card, and, you know, we still got to do the men's uh, main events. Um, that would be the most interesting thing to me, like a thing I would think about, you know, into the future is if we could see Bailey turn heel. That that would be incredible. And I'll, uh, and I'll say to kind of uh, piggyback on that, I think the match I'm most excited to see, even like against how I'd want to feel. Like I don't want to be excited for a Sasha Banks match, but I am pretty excited to watch that Becky versus Sasha Banks match. <laughs> but um, I I think this if Bailey switches, it would be like. Roddy joining the Undisputed Era, where I was like, "Oh my god!" Like I would, I would just be so excited to like rewatch that, and then I could, I, like, I'd be so excited to watch the next episode of the TV taping. And I, I'll say that, that would bring me. I in. feel like everything we've seen from Bailey is that she's right there, like if she isn't already. So I, I, I don't know how much more. Like I know she's still bubbly, but I feel like she's almost sarcastic bubbly now. But, um. But yeah, I think I think she's on the cusp. If I had to put like a, a feeling on it or like a gauge, she's she's definitely there. Yeah. Um, well, let's uh, let's move on to a match. I think it is actually a little tough to uh, like. I would not want to put money on is is Rollins and Strowman against Dolph Ziggler and Robert Roode. Um, right. I think at first at first glance you'd be like, why would Dolph and Roode win this? But you know, Rollins and Strowman. Yeah, I gotta fight each other in about half an hour. Um, so I I don't know. I I guess you could kind of see them having that moment where they break up, uh, and you know, like mid match, and then lose the belts. But it's also their first title defense, and what the hell was the point of even getting them together if they're gonna have basically one match and then give it up? And and especially to give it up to Ziggler and and Robert Roode, who did not need to be put together. But you could imagine that they wanted to have these guys hold the tag titles and maybe, um, you know, lose them. I don't know, lose them later. And they they knew they weren't going to lose them at this pay-per-view. So they put together a tag team that will never exist after after Clash. So that's one way to write that. And all these other tag teams didn't have to lose to Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman. So I, I'm going to say Seth and Braun are going over in the Raw Tag Team Championship match. And then uh, they'll just continue to have this awkward will-they-won't-they-become-enemies, you know, even after this Universal Championship match, um, which I don't know if you want to jump into that. But I, I'm picking Seth and Braun to go over in that Tag Championship match. I'm actually, uh, you know, I'm going to say that by God, maybe they're going to make that tag team turmoil mean something. So I'm going to say Dolph and Robert go over because of Seth and Braun breaking up. Um, yeah, but let's jump into the one-on-one. -on -one. Rollins, uh, you know, the champion going against Strowman. Um, Matt, I think it was my, my favorite comment of yours in the past three months when you said, oh, Strowman's getting a title shot. It must be the fall. Yep. Uh, <laughs> because he, he always gets kind of the dead zone for wrestling, you know, you know, when football's on, so wrestling kind of has to take a little bit of a backseat here for a couple months. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I, oof. they haven't pulled the trigger yet on giving Braun the strap. Um, I, I don't know if they ever will. Yeah. Um, I guess, because if you make him champion, I, I don't really know what you do to, to give him a feud. You know what I mean? Because he's so big. It would have to be like a Brock. It would have to be like the Fiend. It would have to be something like that. And knowing that, you know, we've seen some of the tea leaves that the Fiend might be, you know, interjecting himself. Maybe this is, you know, because the Fiend is not on the card. Maybe he just kind of interferes. We don't get a clean finish in this match. Something like that. Yeah. Um, that, for me, would not be the most interesting thing, as much as I love the Fiend. Um I, I'm not a huge fan of those those kind of moments. Um, I, I'd prefer for Rollins to just win, but now that I think about it, that might be where the Fiend popped up. Yep. No, and I. what's funny is I wasn't even thinking that, and then you said it, and I went, oh, oh right, yeah, that's how that's ending. Um, that is a 1,000% how that match is ending. 
Uh, but I'm cool. I'm cool with that. Um, I mean, here's the thing. I don't want, right? I don't want the Fiend in a Universal Championship match, right? We can all agree on that. But if that is... We get it. Right. Oh, go ahead. If that is our future, then I can't do anything about it, which sounds like that's the case, then, you know, cool. Let's do it that way. Let's have... The Fiend interrupt, uh, you know, the end of the pay-per-view, and we, we get to see him again. And uh, he'll do it in probably a very dramatic fashion, and we'll enjoy the end of that night quite a bit. And I, I think what we'll see is Braun do enough to get over Seth, and um, Braun will get to stay strong, but he still will not be Universal Champion. Um, and what we could very well see is Braun become champion because of The Fiend at the next pay-per-view. But then again, that even sucks. Like, if The Fiend's going to be in a Universal Championship match, he better goddamn win the title, or this whole thing is just gone kaput for me. Uh, I, I'll start booing The Fiend if that's what's going to happen. If they not only put him in a Universal t- title match and he loses, then they have no idea what they're doing. Um, but uh, with that, we've got one last match. Clash of Champions, we've got the WWE Championship match. Kofi Kingston, champion, going against Randy Orton. Mike, Kofi is losing the goddamn title. The streak has ended. Randy's going to get that uh, that title. Uh, what is this, 15 now for him? I can't remember. 14? How many times has Randy been champion? Yeah, you, you even sounded tired saying that number. What is it, uh... Oof, uh, fifteen? <laughs> yeah, it's it's right up there. It's uh, it's not. I don't think it's at Triple H. I don't think. I thought it was Ric Flair. I thought it was Ric Flair, Triple H, Cena, Orton. Well, what, the, what sucks is that they've been saying it like every single every week. yeah every every yeah. time he's he's on the screen. It's uh, all right. Let's let's go through this. Uh, championships and accomplishments. Um. Oh God, this is gonna be tough. Uh, four times world heavyweight champion, nine times WWE champion. Boom, thirteen. So this would be number fourteen. All right. Uh, so I, I was I was one off, and then I got it right on my second guess. Uh, so that's that. That would be number fourteen. And I'll tell you what, I do want Ric Flair to lose his stupid record because I'm sick of Ric Flair. Um, and the way I want it. Yeah. To- what is that lawsuit with Becky Lynch? Oh my God. What a petty old fart. Like. What a petty old piece of shit trying to get the legal rights to the man, Namaker. I don't, I don't know if everyone's heard, but he he better not win that lawsuit. Like, I, there's nothing there. Like, no, he, even took he, he the didn't gimmick. even. The, the Nature Boy's not even his. Right. He took that gimmick, the the man from somebody else too. So, and and even when he says it. The, you uh, to be the man you got to beat the man he went other way he went different ways with that like it was about him winning so that you know for you to be the man you have to beat the man so it was always like yeah. it wasn't always him talking about himself so it was just it's this nonsensical i'm old i need attention i need to validate myself that's what this is it's ridiculous oh my god do you want to hear something awesome yeah. so uh rick flair was that the 1992 Royal Rumble that he won? Yeah, sure. Oh, my God. All right, so the Nature Boy, he stole that from Buddy Rogers. Yeah. Okay. Buddy Rogers died June 26th, 1992. Oh, my God. Right, right there. And then Ric Flair, you know, was the Nature Boy. Well, I mean. Right, right, right. Like, the what was the date of the 92 Royal Rumble? Was it that day? Did you say June? Oh, I'm sorry, June. I thought, why wasn't I? I was thinking January. Good Lord. I had it right in my head. <laughs> so he 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 he, uh, he watched it for six months, and Buddy Rogers said, no more. <laughs> Poor Buddy. This is it. Ric Flair took that That's for it. me. I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm done. I'm out. That's that, uh, he, that new Sponge. He said goodbye to that us. That new SpongeBob meme. It's just. Rick Flair's <laughs> the man. Uh, I'm a head out. <laughs> oh, Rick Flair, you bastard. Uh, hopefully he loses that lawsuit. Hopefully Becky keeps it. I, 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 
I don't know what he could possibly present to a courtroom to, to get ownership of that. It's preposterous. But what a dickhole. Yep. Uh, but, Matt, as far as Kofi and Randy go, I think that in years past we've seen those two guys like on the card, and you're kind of like, ah, I'm sure it'll be a fine match. I, I'm legitimately excited to watch these two fight again. I, I kind of like their uh, their chemistry, so I'm I'm pumped to see it. Um, as far as what I'm expecting from this match, I'm expecting some some real vengeance, uh, some real authority with the strikes. And uh, I I think you're right. I think the Viper goes over, and uh, you know we kind of reset things here uh, with the fall upon us, especially with uh, you know Fox taking ownership of this show, and I think they. You know, maybe you want to see Randy Orton debut as the champion instead of Kofi. I, you know what, with the Fox thing though, I'm gonna say the exact opposite. I think they'd love to have Kofi as the champion because then they get the New Day. They don't look, you know, I, I, I'm gonna say it. They they look more diverse that way. Like that's that would be a good marketing tactic. I, I feel like, especially with you know, blonde haired, blue eyed Charlotte coming into the picture is my prediction. Um, so. <laughs> I think Kofi would be good, but you are like you are right. Like when it comes to getting the 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 fan without who's who doesn't have his ear to the ground like us, who isn't doing a podcast on a weekly basis. Because I think every wrestling fan does a podcast, but um, when you're not doing that podcast on a weekly basis, I, I think you are thinking of Randy Orton before you think of Kofi Kingston. So there's a lot there's a lot of merit to that. But if they were gonna have Kofi keep it, it would definitely be. And I, I'm speaking from a business perspective like this does happen folks if you don't think coca-cola changes their ads to trick you into thinking that they care about causes and things like that um you're nuts so fox making the decision to have kofi be champion like the conversation immediately would go to how diverse that would be and how great that would that would go to their pr so there there is that too but I, i'm still gonna say randy is is gonna take this and and really long and short of it because of what you were saying mike but just to kind of be devil's advocate for a second there um but i i also think it's 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 good uh, to get randy closer uh to breaking rick flair's record and what i never actually finished saying was that i want john cena to break the record and i want him to do it while he's fighting randy orton who's almost there too i think that would be amazing like wrestlemania have a like the last john cena randy orton match and the winner gets to hold the Ric Flair record or take over Ric Flair's record. I think that would be amazing. You just got to figure out some way to get them both into the match and not have them be champion. So it's kind of confused. It, it's difficult. Maybe like 60 year old triple H will be the champ. And and then, uh, or maybe the, the rock how about like a, a best of, Best of five falls, but every time you get a fall, that counts as a championship reign. <laughs> so, but then John's going to really destroy that record then, because he's he's already tied with Ric Flair. He's just got to beat him. Well, he, he might lose it, like, you know, three to two, but they'll both beat Ric Flair, which is ultimately our goal here. <laughs> just destroy him. I mean, you know what's going on? I bet they told Ric Flair that's what's going on, so that's why he filed that lawsuit. <laughs> oh they gave him a warning about what's happening at wrestlemania the best of five matches, exactly where every every pinfall is a is a new reign <laughs> yeah okay. all right so we've got three okay. world heavyweight championships and then yeah so he's a 16 time champion Woo! all right well matt mike no uh now we just gotta see what's gonna happen and uh yeah, coming up, we have our first ever interview of a non-brother of discussion. <laughs> uh, usually we're just interviewing each other, but this, uh, pretty cool. Again, we uh, we spoke with uh, Shelly Pack, the writer and star of the movie Chasing Molly, and uh, the director, Josh Sutherland. Um, Chasing Molly is a comedy that you can find streaming just about anywhere, Um but especially on Amazon Prime right now, it's free if you have the subscription. Um, yeah, Chase Miley tells the story of two phony psychic mediums who rob their clients blind. Uh, then they accidentally steal the drugs uh, while they're robbing one of their clients, steal the drugs of a local kingpin, and they uh, 
you know, the rest of the movies, I'm desperately trying to appease this kingpin and survive a host of obstacles. Um, part of the reason we did this interview, we were really excited to meet Shelly, but the, the co-stars of this movie include Felicia Day, who you've recently seen in uh, the Mystery Science Theater reboot. Um, the one with, uh, I'll, I'll have... you know, the usual mystery, mystery science theater dudes and Pat Oswalt. And then uh, WWE Hall of Famer Kurt Angle is in this movie. Right. I, I would say that would be um, over Felicia Day. That would be the reason why we're talking. Right. So. Well, I wanted to <laughs> say it last and kind of finish it with like a big swoop. Uh, right. Anyway, we had a lot of fun meeting Shelly, who is um, you know an alumni of the Groundlings, Second City. Josh, who's been visual effects director for a host of things you've probably seen, including Looper, The Avengers, and Pee-wee's Big Holiday. Um, but yeah, in addition to some anecdotes about themselves in the movie, Shelley, uh, took some time to talk to us about what it was like to work with, uh, WWE Hall of Famer Kurt Angle on this movie set. Uh, she shared some pretty crazy stories about the former Olympian. Um, and yeah, how he, uh, definitely got to be free of his, uh, PG handcuffs. Uh, you definitely get to hear some colorful language from Kurt. Um, I'd say he says fuck about 15 times in this movie. Uh, really great. <laughs> really funny. Um, yeah, it was a real treat for us, and uh, we hope you guys enjoy this interview, too. Yeah, really excited you guys reached out, because, uh, you know, we took some time to definitely watch the movie and catch up a little bit on you guys. It's like awesome. who you are, at least uh, who we could find on uh, Google and IMDb, all that fun stuff. So, yeah. Um, Good. Good, awesome. Okay, yeah, that's cool. kind of the yeah, that's kind of the text. Um, I guess we kind of wanted to find out like how you how you two first um, kind of came together and decided to do this this project, this movie we're going to talk about, chasing Molly. Sure. You want to just uh, get rolling and are, get are we in it? Are we? Oh going? yeah, we're doing it. We're doing it. Oh great. We're doing We're this uh, Pete Holmes style. We're live, buddy. We're going. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> So, um, Shelly and I met, man, a long time ago. I don't know, maybe like seven years ago. We basically, um, you know, just, I met Shelly and she actually takes a lot of her time to do her, her humanitarian efforts, such as feeding the homeless, specifically working with children with autism, uh, which is awesome. And she, we met and, uh, she knew I was a filmmaker and we actually made a short film about one of her students, um, that, uh, called Dashiell, A Journey Through Autism was a short film. And so, you know, we did that project together, um, and I will say, Shelly is extremely tenacious. Uh, she sent that little short, short film everywhere around the world. I mean, when we wrapped, I literally would get an email, you know, every couple of weeks being like, hey, I submitted our, you know, our film, and it's playing in Moscow, or it's playing in Brazil, or it's playing wherever. And so that, I think that little you know, short film played in probably 30 countries uh, at the end of it. And so that just proved to me, obviously, that... Shelly's passionate and then also she'll get, you know, stuff that she produces seen. And so we, that's how we first met is we, we made that short film together. Um, and we just ever since then have kind of been uh, business partners, whether it's producing, writing, and, um, you know, we, we decided that we really want to make feature comedy movies. And so uh, we did. And that became Chasing Molly. Yeah, Josh and I, you know, he's been fortunate enough to work on a lot of big pictures and has a really nice camera package and he has I mean just from pre-production to filming to editing and everything he just kind of a jack of all trades and so for me to be able to have like kind of the on-camera talent and then Josh knows everything behind the camera it was a perfect you know uh, meeting of the minds and we just really enjoy working together and you can he kind of has the same uh, warped sense of humor. Are you in like a garbage dump? I don't know where you are, Josh. <laughs> a dude on a dirt bike just rode by. I'm in Brooklyn, and uh, yeah, I'm on I'm on set in Brooklyn. So it's, it's, it's okay. It's okay. I'm in uh, on the outskirts of Detroit, and we have uh, uh, unsanctioned motorbike races. Uh, they're about to start here in just a few minutes. So uh, amazing, Josh. I'm gonna catch up with you here momentarily. Uh, I love it. I love it. So, yeah, Josh and I, we were like, you know, let's make movies. We love it. We both love watching, making movies, every part of it. 
Um, and so we, we decided to start making features. Uh, we had one property, uh, a comedy and the investors just, you know, they're coming through, they're not coming through. And we just got sick of that whole game. And we said, let's just make something that we can start picking off and shooting ourselves. So we came up with a story for Chasing Molly, kind of a run the gauntlet story um, about my character, who's a paranormal con artist. And I accidentally rip off um, a drug kingpin. And so we came up with the story, meticulously planned it out. And Josh goes, okay, when you've got 90 pages written, then we're going to start shooting. So maybe like a month later, I got, had the pages written and um, we started shooting what we could and then it snowballed. We started getting bigger and bigger talent. I reached out to all the comedian friends I knew and uh, the project just snowballed. Um, getting Felicia Day, getting Kurt Angle on the picture was obviously, you know, just <laughs> a yeah, miraculous moment. I mean, that yeah. was... Yeah, that was, caught our eye. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Kurt... Uh, not only, you know, as an all-star, uh, you know, in the ring, but also on camera and as a person. And so I managed to reach out to his, uh, his team and he actually read the script. Kurt's very hands-on with his career and he decided he wanted to do our project based on the material. Uh, was not about the money. I promise you, we're a very independent film. <laughs> so, uh, and so Kurt did the movie because he really responded to the script. And it's definitely not something in his comfort zone. Uh, this character, he plays uh, the villain and he plays a ruthless, first of all, a drug dealer, which is not him at all. Exactly. Um, he, he curses. Uh, he, he plays this guy that's really we've never seen before um, on camera from him. And it's really a treat to see him play this character. And he delivers. He, I mean, he nails it. He's really, really, really good and really strong as this character. And um, Chasing Molly just, it, it was a passion project that just snowballed into something that became commercial and marketable and uh it's just been a dream come true the whole thing to finally see it come together and it to be something that we're so proud of so um and then to be able to talk to you guys about it it's, it's just really cool yeah for sure i mean um i think at least you know kurt's work um obviously mostly through wwe but he's, he's definitely had the handcuffs as far as uh verbally um you know, where WWE is trying to be a family friendly, family, family friendly um, affair. And I think you guys got him saying fuck at least 15, 16 times, <laughs> <laughs> which I got to think was a little bit of a thrill for him uh, to be on camera think, saying something like that. Yeah. Did he get to improvise some of that or was that all, all uh, it was um, written, in the script? It, and that was in the script, uh, but he delivered it very naturally, which is really just a credit to him as an actor. Um, to be able to deliver it so naturally, um, which is really what we want from our actors. So, you know, I'm an improviser, come from an improv background. And so it's important for Josh and I to have the performances be really natural um, and, and a little off the wall as well. So we attract people and we want to work with people that are willing to go there. And this whole project, like you said, it felt, felt very freeing and liberating to get to say the things we want to say. And we didn't have anyone telling us we couldn't do or say certain things. Right. Yeah. So it's almost like your parents were out of town and you could just <laughs> do whatever you wanted. Um, and that's what we did. And chasing Molly is almost like what would happen if, you know, the studio executives left and let you just really do what you wanted to do. And, um, Thankfully, we had all the gear and all the talent that you would get on a big project, but we had all the freedom of the independent film. Um, so it was just really, uh, really freeing for Josh and I to be able to create on that level um, without anyone uh, censoring us. And then to get the actors to be able to, you know, have fun with the role, play things they haven't played, and then to say things like you said, Kurt, you know, is very handcuffed in the WWE. They say, you know, it has to be family friendly and people are always itching for something more, you know? And so for him to get out and to be able to do something like this, a really unfiltered raw comedy um, was cool. And he's been, you know, really excited about how the movie came out. And so that was a relief, yeah. too, you know, you're like, God, I hope he likes this. You, know, you hope everyone likes it. We love it. <laughs> um, you're like, please, you know, you hope he loves it. And it turns out he did. So we're like, ah, oh, 
whew, that was a relief. Um, so it was, was really great that we're just so happy and honored he would do the project. And then the fact that he liked it so much that he'd be promoting it uh, is just is just beyond. He definitely does not need to do that. Um, and so it's just because he feels passionate about it that he's doing it, which is amazing. Yeah, well, for sure. Uh, oh, go ahead, man. Well, I was, I was going to go, I wanted to back up, uh, go back into the story a little bit and, and ask about, um, you know, we kind of, we kind of came up with a short summary of this paranormal investigation kind of team. We've got the crazy self pleasuring pills, I guess we've already said, <laughs> we've already said fuck. So I can say the, the self dick sucking pills. Uh, <laughs> it, it, pills yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, like where, where do you start with the story? You, you know, you, you put out the, uh, you wanted to, this is the story you wanted to make and I had an absolute <laughs> okay. blast watching it. So where, yeah, where did the, I guess, where did the seeds get planted to start this? So we, uh, <laughs> go ahead, John. I mean, we want to make the funniest movie possible. So it's not yeah. like in, as so, kids, we were like, wanted to make a movie about dick jokes. I mean, you just... <laughs> It's not like, you know, you, there's a tear in your eye as you tell the story, but we just kept going, what if, what if, what if, yeah. and then going from there and making it, pushing and pushing the envelope, um, and, it, and it just kept snowballing as to where um, we just kept trying to think, what is some, the, what, what is the most, you know, we can, mileage we can get out, and we don't want to waste a second of film on fluff. It has to be hilarious. And so we just kept pushing and pushing until we got the funniest thing. But it wasn't like, well, as kids, we had dreamed of telling about, you know, people giving themselves, you know, tasting no. the tip. But we just <laughs> felt that it made us laugh, you know, over and over again. And then um, so for us, that was what was the gauge. That was the bar is like we had to just think this was funny every time we saw it. And we've seen this movie at least probably a few hundred times. <laughs> Well, I, I like to like think of it as I don't know if you guys have seen Kevin James movie Red State where uh, so that was a that was a Netflix. But the way he wrote it is he said he would come to each fork in the road and there would be two options that he would see and he would immediately go find a third option that made absolutely no sense. Not to say that your guys' option didn't make any sense. But it was just so off the wall and crazy. Yeah. Like, I, I couldn't, I felt like I was holding For the sure. side of the yeah. couch to keep my, my, my ass strapped in because I was laughing <laughs> so hard. But I don't know, yeah, yeah, we, for, uh, your, for your process, yeah. Yeah, was there a I lot mean, of, like, method research? Like, a lot of self or <laughs> <laughs> Plenty. Josh? That was too, Josh? too much. Too Josh, much. if you want to weigh in there. Yeah, Josh <laughs> weigh in on no, three balls for all of our yeah. research. I just want, I mean, honestly, m most of the story came out of necessity. And what I mean when I say that is like, we, you know, like Shelly said from the beginning, we wanted to make something that we knew we could make, that we didn't have to wait on anyone else to say no, and we could just do it ourselves. And so yeah. what that means, obviously, is like, we live in LA. The story takes place in LA. You know, I, I, I like to say too, like, kind of once you know the rules, um, you can bend the rules. And so I've been lucky enough to be on some pretty big film sets and like, we structured the story specifically, especially in this pre-production, um, in ways that we knew we could do this ourselves. And basically, a normal movie, a normal feature film that has money, <laughs> has a lot of money, um, mm -hmm. you know, they'll shoot 60 days back to back. They shoot it all out of order. So basically for us, we made the story like a run the gauntlet where it's like a night, a day, and a night. So that way, whether it's two days or two weeks before we're getting the crew together to shoot, like the you know, there's not a lot of costume changes. The people show up, they're wearing basically the same thing. Um, that eliminates the need for wardrobe. It elim eliminates a lot of the script supervision that has to happen for continuity. Stuff like that. So we kind of like bent the rules enough with the story to facilitate that. And, um, you know, that allowed us to get really creative with the other ways, which is specifically what you're talking about. Is like, we don't have an endless bucket to throw at visual effects, to throw at huge actors to, to sell this movie. All we have is the comedy. So literally we know this movie like straddles the line between like appropriate and unacceptable. And that's really exactly where we want it, right? <laughs> it's like literally yeah. like that's all we have is just the, almost the absurdity, right? So me and Shelly had a lot of fun kind of planning what, what was going to happen throughout Chasing Molly. And um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, literally, if we'd sat there and exactly just say what if and just let 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 the chips fall where they may. 
Yeah. You know, yeah, watching comedy, it's like the last thing you want as a comedian is like to know what's happening. And we so much like comedies, it's like you see what's coming. And so it's like we really did not, we wanted to make something where it's like, you didn't know what was happening. I mean, it's going to make sense, but we wanted to take you on a ride that you weren't like, okay, here it comes. He's going to come here with this joke, and here it is. Um, we wanted something completely different. You know, we wanted to shake things up, and we would be able to structure so we could reach out to, like, high-level comedians and say, listen, we only need you for one day um, to come in and shoot the funniest material possible, and then we're not going to bother you again. And so we were able to keep doing that over and over again. Same thing with Kurt. And uh, so he came in, and because of his work performing live, you know, we didn't have dress rehearsals. We weren't, uh, you know, it was like show up. You have three takes, maybe maybe less, and we need you to nail it. And he didn't need any practice. He brought it the first take, and we get another for safety and move on. I mean, that's independent filmmaking where you would, you know, on a big set, big studio film, you know, three or four pages a day. We were shooting, you know, 10, 12 pages a day. Um, so there was no time for error and then no time for uh, the actors to not uh, give that deliver the performance. So we really had to have home run hitters coming to the set. And uh, thankfully, we did every performance you see, you know, um, we're really proud of. And if you didn't and there's performances that you'll never see <laughs> that we just did, you know, so uh, <laughs> we were really strict, too. If there was something that Josh and I didn't think was hilarious, even if we spent days, money time anything we wouldn't put it in the movie um because it was important to us the final product was more important than um you know just the dollars um yeah. and i think that's what shows is that we wanted the product to be something that we're proud of well you yeah. can definitely see that too because i mean it, it's even with like the the shorter storylines of watching those two police officers uh, <laughs> oh my god which i, uh, I immediately went up. back and watched those me. Oh my god! This, uh, I think yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Mike, Mike Rose and that. Drew. Yeah. Was that Drew Drogi? Yeah, I'm not Drew Drogi. Yes. Oh my gosh! I they're so I good. I watch those all day. But that's, I, I mean, that's exactly it. Is is you've got all this love going into it, as opposed to what you guys were talking about, like like the big budget. And now I'm gonna carry that those characters and those scenes with me for the rest of my life because it was just this this passionate comedic comedic project. Amazing. Thank you. That's that's what we wanted. It's just nice that to know that that kind of resonates um, from the film because that's exactly what it was. It was like everyone who came on board like just really felt like they're doing this for the love of the game, you know. Because and we're and we're saying it, we're made it with with love. So you could feel that when they were coming to set, um, no one's in their trailer saying like I, I need brown rice, you know. Everyone is like, <laughs> we've got yeah. it. This is this. We love what we're doing, and you know, Josh has done a lot of favors. I've done a lot of favors in the past, and it's building all these relationships, right? So when we needed some special effects in our movie, Josh reached out to friends he's worked with. They've been on, you know, X Men and Wolverine, and they're like, okay. We'll do those shots for you guys for your movie. We're like, what? You know, so it's awesome. We were, wow. we were able to get like really all this talent because people were attracted to the passion of the movie and doing something different. You know, um, like you said, a studio picture, it's X, Y, Z, it's a machine and they make something. But, you know, where's the heart of the story and where's the heart of like the content? And so um, for us, it was every part of the way, um, you know, from picking the sound effects from like the, a urine going in the jug that Felicia's holding mm -hmm. was made with love. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we really stayed up hours to make sure that was right for you guys. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> oh, you can tell. <laughs> you feel it through the screen. That, yes, uh, yes. Good. Like the PH looked really like a healthy hue. Yeah. I really yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Movie God. magic, boys. That's apple juice and water. <laughs> <laughs> well, we kind of, I, we kind of wondered, like, um, you know, just uh, kind of bouncing off that idea of, like, seeing more of the cops or even just seeing more of, of you kind of doing more of the, like, possession hunting, demon hunting, and then yeah. robbing people. Did you ever think about kind of, I, I guess, extending it into more of, like, a series instead of just the standalone movie or... Was that, do you feel like you're kind of done with these characters or do you feel like you kind of want to like grow and expand with them? Because I, I think that it would succeed. 
Man, it's crazy to hear you say that because honestly, like those cop scenes, I'm like, if you just cut the cop scenes and cut a trailer out of that, that could be a total yeah. standalone TV show. Like just <laughs> cops who want to be actors.com would be so <laughs> funny. Um, so I, I agree. But well, once again, we were we were on a mission to create a feature film. Uh, and so sure, sure. Trying, to, trying to stay trying to stay true to that was our was our main goal. And I, I will say there was a couple of times where, she, where I was Shelly and I, I, I happened to do some work a lot for Viacom, uh, which is, you know, a lot of TV stuff. And so I, yeah. I was like, should we pitch this? Should we pitch this as a TV show? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and write more of an arc. And so it, it is hard to kind of like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, avenue. I didn't. Yeah, I wouldn't get away from it being a movie. Like, I love it as is. I just mean, would you go like further? Yeah, no, we have more mean, work. Yeah. It's, you know, we just kind of, wherever creativity takes us, I mean, if the opportunity came up, like, in a heartbeat, you know, um, right. you know, our goal is to, you know, keep making movies, we've got a bunch more ideas, um, and we have another comedy we're working on next, and we're always going to use, you know, people that we know and who have, you know, come in on, on for us, uh, like Mike and Drew, and it's just great to hear, you know, and I always tell them, you know, the compliments, because people will say that, they want, you know, Jeff, who plays Skull Effer in the movie, you know, they want him <laughs> to have his own spinoff, and I just love hearing it, because it's like, these people are not only big talents, but they're personal friends of mine, so it's just, it, it, it you know, it kind of, it really warms my heart to hear that they're being loved, um, it feels good, you know. Uh, we wanted, that was the goal too, is like we wanted to make something where everyone was proud of it and then it could be a launching point, you know, um, the guy who plays Rawhide, Curtis Pickett, he gets a lot of, you know, I get so many compliments on his performance and I just, you know, I want it to lead to other things for all of the actors so they can say like, hey, look, this is me and, you know, I would write the scenes based on who I knew. So I knew Jeff Lewis got angry and it's really funny when he gets angry. So I'm like, let's make him a drug dealer. Let's give him three kids that he's raising by himself. And let's have him like ream a guy on the phone while the kids are allegedly in the room, you know, <laughs> and have him say, you know, he's got a septic for diapers. I mean, I just, <laughs> that's when, that's when you have the heart, you know, the heartwarming moment is when you come up with something like that. Um, but, you know, it's just great to see Jeff, you know, you plant the seed and then we're like, okay. And then you see it come alive and it's more than what you could ever ask for. Cause you've got these performers that are giving it everything and uh, getting back to Kurt, you know, this guy, <laughs> man, he gives it everything. Right. So uh, quick, quick, funny story. We, um, you know, we're asking him for his sizes. We're going to get his wardrobe and he goes, Oh, that's okay. You know, I've got my own custom suit. And we're like, woof. Thank God, you know, that's going to be expensive. We're like, woo, wiping the sweat from our brows. Um, cut to, you know, we don't want to ruin the movie, but towards the end of the movie, he gets very physical on the ground in his own custom suit in an early back alley in Los Angeles. And there was not one glimpse of like, oh, this might, he would have ripped that suit like the Hulk if he had to, to give the performance. He's just that dedicated. And, um, that was just what was so great was that we got these performances and that these actors came to set wanting to give us that. Um, it says a lot to who they are as, as actors. They did it for the because they truly love performing. Um, and, th and that's what's great. And that's what was really cool. Yeah, I mean, Kurt is, is all about, uh, you know, selling, uh, getting into the performance. I don't know if you I don't know how much uh, wrestling fans you two are, um, but I don't know if you ever saw like Kurt playing the ukulele with the tiny little cowboy hat on or uh, showering <laughs> his, his boss with gallons of milk out of a milk truck. Um, but what's, uh, as the wrestling show, we would be remiss if we didn't kind of ask, like, do you two kind of have um, interest in pro wrestling? Are you kind of following it today? Or maybe you watched it, you know, when you were younger or anything like that? So I am new to this. Not, I mean, I knew of it, but it was kind of like on the outskirts. Um, but I have now become a fan of wrestling because I really admire, like, these guys are not only great performers and, and women. I used to watch Glow, Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling. Yes. Um, oh, nice. But, but the perform, I mean, the athleticism, I mean, it's as real as, as anything, you know, um, what they're giving the show that they, that they put on because it's like they not only have to be um, – 
actors and performers, but then they have to be athletes at an extreme level, which is unbelievable. But Josh is a huge wrestling fan. I don't know if we lost. Josh, are you there? Yeah, I'm back on. I'm back on. Sorry. Uh, They're asking about wrestling, and I've been kind of... uh, (laughs) As you know, my state of wrestling is like oh. I'm learning as I go. Um, Listen, um, I mean, I'll just I'll just say I I grew up being a huge a huge wrestling fan. I actually remember I used to live in Saudi Arabia as a kid for a small amount of time and making my mom buy me the WWE magazines. And I mean, for me, always the heyday will be you know Bret Hitman Hart, Shawn Michaels, Gold nice. Dust, Undertaker. Like that will always in my mind be WWE for me. But yeah, I mean, Kurt Angle. So. When we, me and Shelly sat together, right, and like tried to talk about who I envisioned for this character, Mr. Black, uh-huh. uh, I literally was like, yo, I want like a ripped out, huge, physically imposing guy that's a fast talker. He's witty. And I was like, this would be perfect for a wrestler. You know, this idea yep. is a perfect setup. And maybe we can, you know, attract someone who's a little bigger talent than probably, you know, at the beginning of the movie that we thought we could get because it's a crossover, right? It's someone who wants to get in acting. And so we were talking to some other people that, or very low level. And then Shelly one day is like, what about Kurt Angle? And I literally, <laughs> I literally had like my jaw yeah, on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, do you know, like, uh, and you know, Shelly's a little naive when it comes to the wrestling world. And I was like, do you know who you were talking about? He right won now? a title with a broken like, freaking neck. Yeah. I'm like, do, do you <laughs> even understand? I'm like, is that an option? Is this real? Like Kurt Angle? Um, Cause I know what jokes are on the page right now that we're reading. <laughs> and I don't think this is his cup of tea guys. Like, so, um, you know, exactly. If you know his WWE persona, he's very clean cut. He's not really a heel too much. Like, he he definitely doesn't curse. So, um, literally, I was like, I don't think this is, uh, are you making this up? And so, thank God, Kurt is very hands-on with his career. Um, We got in touch with his manager. His manager actually passed on the script to Kurt. We found out Kurt actually read it. Three days later, Kurt actually likes it. um, And he wants to do it. And so... We set up the deal with his uh, agents, uh, who I'm almost positive told him not to do this movie. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so just speaks to, you know, more. I, I'll forever be in Kurt Angle's debt for doing our movie. Um, you know, he, he like Shelly said before, no, no one in our movie is doing it for the money, right? It's just not there. Right. So it's, it's literally, he wanted, you know, he thought it was funny. He took a chance and wanted to, to help us out. And so, you know... He killed it. He brought it. It's so funny having him on set and getting him to say things like twat holes and stuff like that. (laughs) I think it's truly a treat for his fans when you get to watch our movie to see him in a role like that and get to curse and get him to play the bad guy. And he actually said, like, man, we we have an ungodly amount of pages we're trying to get through each day that it really he came out and said he killed it. He turned it on and it. He'd cut and be like, how was that? And you're like, it's great. Like, can we get one more? This is amazing. Uh, and, and I think if you watch the movie, he's really, he really is imposing and kind of scary. And it, and it definitely comes through. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I've been a fan of his for a long time. And uh, it just speaks to, you know, why he won a gold medal, why he's been WWE champ. Like, he, he gives 120% in everything he does. And he brought that to our little independent it's- movie as well. Yeah, it's it's so funny for me, like, uh, you know, you guys saying that he read the script beforehand and then signed on because it almost read like he signed on and then it was like Danny DeVito and Sonny in Philadelphia. Like, let's just see <laughs> what the hell we can get him into, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it let's was cover him in the, yeah. Script. Yeah, I know. It was because he read the script and then he had, <laughs> we wanted to even change some lines. We're like, he didn't read, you know, he didn't read the whole thing. He read the whole thing. I mean, he's so professional. He had all of his lines, like, completely memorized. I mean, better than, like, you could ask for an actor, you know? So, um, it was, you know, first of all, I know I, yes, a little naive. But when I saw Kurt, I was like, this is him. This is Mr. Black. And I am not intimidated by anybody. Even if you took, like, even if I knew, I was still going to approach him because, I think everybody would want to be in my movie. I wasn't intimidated <laughs> at all. Uh, uh, so it was just, but you know, again, if it was just like, if we were just dealing with agents and stuff like that, we wouldn't have really gotten the talent. I mean, same with, you know, we didn't hire a casting director. We went with people, you know, that either personally worked with or someone who were like, this is it. We've got to have this person. And so it's not like a, um, oh, 
this guy works for this studio or has an in with this casting director. And, you know, so we really, every part is really fitting for the actor. And um, that's what's really cool also. And so Kurt, um, he, he went rogue. He was like, I'm doing this movie. And uh, he just, you know, he suplexed everyone in his agency until they... Um, <laughs> They tapped out, and, uh, and and then there he was on set. So I'm learning. I'm learning. Yeah, well, I got. I just want to say, like, two of my favorite types of people, um, and they're kind of for similar reasons, are professional wrestlers and people who do, like, improvising, especially with comedy, because it's, <laughs> yeah. it's so similar where you have to read that room. You have to kind of right. be in that moment. Um, you have a tiny little bit of, a like, a bullet point structure. Um but I mean, you 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 gotta just just that essence of like now here, you know. And I, I think that's why Kurt did such a good job in this movie. Um, and it definitely feels like that's kind of how some of the comedy really um, resonated because I, I you know when you're writing, just really being in that moment and not you know self judging. This it it I think it it really um, it hit both of us. Um, we really liked this movie a lot. Like we we really thought awesome. it was funny. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you. you guys. Yeah, that makes us feel the best because, like, like we said, that's that's literally the only leg we have to stand on is is the comedy and the jokes, and so when people tell us that you know they they laughed making it, we just live in a world nowadays where you need that. It's it's sad, um, but yeah, just to to I I like to <laughs> like to say you know people don't watch comedy movies for the great wardrobe or lighting you know what I mean? <laughs> or stuff like that. So if if we can push that suspension of disbelief just a little bit and get you involved with these characters and their story and you get a little bit of a laugh out of it. That's literally our goal with making this movie. So we appreciate that. Uh, no, actually, uh, don't want to keep tooting horns, but Josh, I just wanted to thank you because it feels like so many like contemporary modern comedies, they just kind of set a camera and forget it. Um, and they just kind of ask the actors to just start improvising. And it, it, it felt like a real director was making an effort to like show people's expressions, um, you know, kind of get the feel when there is a dialogue. So it's just a welcome change of pace because it, it feels like too many of these movies just kind of lean on like having a, like a stationary camera and just saying go instead of like telling us a story with the camera. So just uh, we really appreciated that. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's um, honestly it was like, hard uh hard hard thing to do with such a such a low budget it's embarrassing to tell you like how how low our movie was because i it's sad that i work i work on other stuff that'll be for like snapchat or instagram and sometimes has a bigger budget than than our movie um so it definitely was a passion project and it literally is just you know it's like something that me and shelly just literally it feels like you i imagine this is how it feels like to give birth to a child you know i feel like i've experienced that now and it was (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> making, it was making this movie and um i'm so happy that you know thanks to gravitas uh ventures who was our distributor who who bought it and put it out there for everyone and so it's uh I, I feel lucky enough to in the industry know a bunch of people that i feel like could make a feature film right um but it's another whole thing to to sell that feature film and so we feel extremely blessed um to be in that position yeah, my awesome. my wife and I actually just had a newborn, so then I know exactly where you're at. <laughs> yeah, I want you to tell her that we feel like we know exactly what she went through based on uh, this. <laughs> See how that fits with her. Yeah, um, good, good luck. And congratulations. <laughs> yeah, good Thank luck. you. Congratulations. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, I, I want to, you know, you're complimenting Josh, and I just wanted to, you know, kind of piggyback on that. Um it it was made with love right so it's like josh not only you know was hands on with like the filming and stuff like that but also putting the actors in a position where they felt like they could deliver the performances they did and um creating that kind of environment and it's a relief to me too and that's why we continue to work together because um of the of the kind of product that comes out and you know I've worked with a lot of directors and it's, they're not always the easiest to work with or create the best content. So when I teamed up with Josh and knowing what he brings to the set, um, was just really, really a blessing. And I'm glad that you guys saw that, um, in the film. Cause he really, he really did. Um, every shot is like, is really <laughs> hands on. And, um, you know, that's the thing also about the movie. It's like, because it was just kind of the two of us pushing it the whole way, um, we weren't going to let anything drop. 
And we also wanted to make sure that it was really representative of, of who we were as, um, as creators. And so to hear you guys respond in that way is just, you know, amazing. And like Josh said, there's so many things out there that are negative in our world. Um, and we're bombarded with that daily. Um, the first like things that are trending are like all tragedies and it's so unfortunate and we just need to, at some point come together and, and find time to laugh and find time to like, um, step out of everything and take that, take that time to, to, to laugh with each other. Um, and I feel like comedies, it's kind of rare, you know, there's not too many out there and, um, we're just really honored that we got to make the one that that's out there now. Well, I know this is probably the last thing you guys, uh, really do want to talk about, cause this should be about like celebrating the accomplishment of having this movie come out and having it be a fun watch. But, uh, what, what's coming up next for you guys? Is there anything, the two of you are working on together or anything uh, in particular you guys want us to keep an eye on? Um, yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, we made Chesley Molly kind of because we had investors fall through another project and we're actually circling, circling back to that one now. And uh, it's really actually, in my opinion, the, the script is hysterical. It's another um, script that Shelley had written previously. Um, and, you know, it's about another female lead, another comedy. Uh, it's more of an ensemble cast, but it's about finding love in all the wrong places uh, in Hollywood. And so it's really topical for the Me Too movement. It's almost uh, serendipitous that it wasn't made back then and fell through because it's the way the environment is now uh, with the Me Too movement. It's, it really makes this movie perfect um, for this time period. And so we are aggressively packaging that one right now. We have some verbal attachments that we can't really name names uh, yet, but... Um, it, we're just super excited and once we uh once we get all the meetings and everything straight and hopefully we'll be making that one sooner than later oh that sounds awesome yeah uh really excited to you know like josh said the the universe knows what it's doing and uh it had to happen now and i went back into the script and re and rewrote it um with you know all these things that had happened and things that as a female i want to say and as a comedian i want to say and it's important to josh and i that women in film are uh celebrated and um so it's a perfect time uh for this movie to come out and we we really are going to shake things up again <laughs> with this one that's good well as uh, uh for my brother and i as two uh white males uh, we, <laughs> we, uh, we we definitely know uh you know that 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 time is ready for for more movies like that to come out so we're ready for it um so i'm excited to to see when that when that does hit because now uh all i had to do was hit that old follow button on imdb so now i you guys can't hide perfect. from me now. So no. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, we're out of the shadows. And yeah, yeah. I mean, if you guys, um, I'm on set in New York right now currently, um, working on some crazy, insane projects. I can't really say what it is, but um, if you ever want to see behind the scenes, generally I post it to Instagram or all my social media stuff. And so um, that's at Sutherland Film, S-U-T-H-E-R-L-A-N-D-F-I-L-M. And uh, this week specifically, I I'm on a crazy shoot on Tuesday and... Uh, next week as or the week two weeks from now as well and so i definitely post behind the scenes stuff from that but um you know me and shelly are always working and so we are aggressively going after this next feature and uh, we're excited to uh share it with the world nice and I, I was just jealous when i heard that you were partying out in brooklyn but now i'm <laughs> <laughs> suburbs and uh and out way outside of detroit so now i'm really bumming i'm super jelly now um, <laughs> yeah anytime we get to travel for work i feel blessed um so it's cool <laughs> to be here because uh, i'm based in la obviously um but yeah anytime i can come to do uh beach traveling and get it paid to do that i feel very very lucky nice well i'll i'll say uh i gotta remind everybody to head over to uh amazon prime to check out chasing molly is there any uh last words you guys want to throw out um any last plugs or pleas for for people to go watch uh this this fantastic comedy yeah i i'd like to offer my plea to your audience um <laughs> i uh, i just well first of all i'm just I'm messing with you i just want to thank you guys uh for having us on your show uh it's just so awesome to connect with people like you who are appreciative of what we're doing and i hope you guys uh watch chasing molly we're on amazon prime free right now uh you can also watch us on itunes um fandango redbox on demand and, 
and DVD or Blu-ray. You're going to want it. I promise you. The holidays are coming up. So go to Target.com, <laughs> BestBuy.com, Amazon.com, <laughs> Walmart.com, and get yourself a copy um, of Chasing Molly. And uh, Chasing underscore Molly on Twitter, Chasing Molly Movie Instagram, Chasing Molly Movie Facebook. And if you're in L.A., I perform live with Improv for the People. Yes. And uh, just once again, thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your uh, evening to interview us. And yeah, exactly. Shows shows like you and letting us connect uh, with not only you, but your audience is the reason we get to keep making movies. And so we sincerely appreciate it. So thank you for having us on. Yep, thank yeah. You. And again, one last thank you for, for making this great film. And uh, I, I'm going to give my brother a chance to say thank you too. But uh, good luck to everything uh, with, with the rest of this journey here. Perfect. Yeah, Sh- yeah, Shelly, Josh, it was truly a pleasure to meet you. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing what you got on the social media, uh, your future projects, and uh, yeah, check out brothersofdiscussion.com. We'll have that Thank episode you guys. up for you. you. guys can listen to yourselves. Pretty fun. Yeah, we will blast <laughs> it out and share it as well, so we appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. You bet. Awesome. You guys have a good one. You too. You too. Good night. Good night. <laughs>